Let's pick up where we left off with theme number one. We're asking the question, what does the Book of Mormon contribute to our understanding of Jesus, his mission, his atoning sacrifice, and how we tap into that power in our daily lives? Last video, we talked about Jesus offered himself an offering for sin to answer the ends of the law. Then we found two verses in the Book of Mormon suggest what the law requires for transgression and that Jesus has to answer those ends to an infinite level. We saw that one of those payments was guilt and that one man's guilt was enough to cause him to shrink and in torment and agony. And Jesus had to pay an infinite level of guilt in order to satisfy the demands of justice. But we saw that once he did so, he went into the Father's presence and claimed his rights of mercy. If he paid an infinite penalty, then he claimed infinite rights of mercy, which means our Savior has infinite rights of mercy to save all of us that so choose to submit to his requests and to save each of us no matter what we've done. His atonement, we saw last time, can reach into the very depths of hell and snatch the most lost of all mankind. He claimed that amount of mercy. There is an infinite amount of mercy in his gift of his atonement. That's what he claimed. We also saw that justice demands a withdrawal from the Spirit. When we transgress, we must withdraw from the Spirit. And that in answering the ends of the law, Christ found himself completely abandoned by God, completely away from and without God or any presence of God. He must have found himself in the darkest of all abysses, completely alone, rejected as if it were by the Father. And that in paying that penalty, he owns the right, he bought the right to snatch us. Justice may demand that we withdraw from the Holy Ghost and from him, but justice cannot demand that he withdraw from us. He may withdraw from us temporarily so that we feel the pains associated with repentance and we change our hearts, but he can be with us anytime he so chooses. He bought that right, and it is my personal testimony that he exercises it frequently that he rushes into our lives immediately when we invite him in. And Alma and Ammon both used that wonderful word. They were snatched. Very descriptive of his ability to overcome the withdrawal that the Spirit demands and be with us and snatch us and embrace us. It is my testimony that Jesus paid the price that justice demands. Now, there may be others, but I can find no other verse in the Book of Mormon that suggests that there is another payment to be made to justice. If there is, let's assume he made that payment and bought the rights to claim us. Today, we're going to ask the question, what else? What else was involved in what Neil A. Maxwell referred to as the awful arithmetic of his atonement? What other penalties whether they were required by justice or not, what other payments did he make? And that's where the Book of Mormon opens our eyes to a beautiful insight into what Jesus accomplished in Gethsemane. This wonderful verse in Alma chapter 7, verses 11, 12, is a major restoration of lost, plain, and precious truths and gives us a tremendous insight into what Jesus accomplished in Gethsemane. Let's break each one of these words down and digest it one at a time. It says, he shall go forth suffering pains. And then it adds, of every kind. Now, if his atonement is infinite, we're going to apply that in both breadth and depth. Jesus had to experience an infinite level of pains. And he had to experience each one of those pains to an infinite depth. It's as if he broke his arm every possible way you can break an arm. There is no possible way for a human being to break their arm in a way that he hasn't experienced. 
Now, I don't know how he fully did that because we know he didn't actually break his arm, but he experienced that pain. Every possible human pain. No one breaks their arm in any possible way, whether that's a green strick fracture or a compound fracture or it broke here or here or here or at this elbow. He broke his arm in every possible infinite way. And he experienced each one of those to an infinite depth. Every human pain. Now that's astounding. He's had every possible migraine, every possible operation, every cut, every broken bone, every possible pain, the infinite number of pains possible in a human experience. And he has taken each one of them to an infinite depth so that he knew that pain infinitely well. Think about what that means. He has experienced every human pain. The next word in our list is afflictions. He has suffered afflictions of every kind. So I would ask you to ponder, what afflicts someone that you love? I love people who deal with severe depression. That is certainly a human affliction. So how many varieties of depression has Jesus known? Every single one. And to the depth, how far, how intimately involved, how depressed has Jesus been in every possible variance? He has been infinitely depressed. He knows depression. He knows addiction. It's as if he has experienced an addiction to every possible substance, to every possible degree. He understands the concept, the affliction of addiction. He understands every human possible scenario. The next word on our list is temptations. He has experienced every type of temptation, every possible way you and I are tempted. And he has taken that temptation to an infinite level. He has been infinitely tempted by every single one of them. So no matter what temptation I may face and to what level, he is very familiar with that level of temptation. The next word we have is that he taketh upon himself the sicknesses of his people. Sicknesses. How nauseated had he, has he been? How many varieties? How about mental illnesses? How many varieties of mental illness are there? And he has experienced every single one of them. And he has taken each one of them to an infinite depth. Every sickness, every affliction, every pain, every temptation. The next phrase is that he will take upon him death. I suggest that the wording there is take upon him all these different ways of death. I don't understand how it happened, but Jesus has taken upon him every possible form of death. Every one of them. He has drowned. He has died of COVID, of cancer. He's been crushed. He's been decapitated. Every possible way. He's been burned at the stake. No one in this planet dies in any way that he isn't intimately familiar with because he took that affliction to an infinite level. He suffered that affliction to an infinite amount. He knows it that well. Then our last word is infirmities. He takes upon us our infirmities. I don't know what the difference is between an affliction, a sickness, and infirmities, but I think the idea here is Jesus becomes intimately familiar with every aspect of the human experience. He knows rape. He knows abortion. He knows every possible aspect of the human experience, and each one of them to an infinite level. Now, that is astounding. I cherish this quotation from Sister Cheko Okasaki, 
who served as the first counselor in the General Relief Society presidency from 1990 to 1997. She was speaking to a group of women, so if you're not a woman, you could apply this to your circumstances. But she said, Jesus experienced the totality of mortal existence in Gethsemane. It is our faith that he experienced everything, absolutely everything. Sometimes we don't think through the implication of that belief. We talk in great generalities about the sins of all humankind, about the suffering of the entire human family, but we do not experience pain in generalities. We experience it individually. That means Jesus knows what it felt like when your mother died of cancer, how it was both for your mother and still is for you. He knows what it felt like to lose the student body election. He knows that moment when the brakes locked and the car started to skid. He experienced the slave ship sailing from Ghana toward Virginia. He experienced the gas chambers of Dukau. He experienced napalm in Vietnam. He knows about drug addiction and alcoholism. There is nothing you have experienced as a woman that he does not know and recognize. On a profound level, he understands about pregnancy and giving birth. He knows about PMS and cramps and menopause. He understands about rape and infertility and abortion. He understands your mother pain when your five-year-old leaves for kindergarten, when a bully picks on your fifth grader, when your daughter calls to say that the new baby has Down syndrome. He knows your mother rage when a trusted babysitter sexually abuses your two-year-old when someone gives your 13-year-old drugs, when someone seduces your 17-year-old. He knows the pain you live with when you come home to a quiet apartment where the only children who ever come are visitors. When you hear that your former husband and his new wife were sealed in the temple last week, when your 50th wedding anniversary rolls around and your husband has been dead for two years. He knows all that. He's been there. He's been lower than all of that. What a treasured truth that the Book of Mormon has restored, that Jesus has become intimately acquainted with the human experience. He knows every pain you suffer. Now, why? What did he buy? What did he buy by, in, by experiencing an infinite level of the human experience, every possible human pain, every affliction, every sickness, every infirmity, every possible way to die? What did he buy? Now, we could spend a lot of time here in the Book of Mormon talking about what he purchased, but I want to continue the rest of that verse in Alma chapter 7. After describing that he took upon us his, our infirmities, it says, that his bowels may be filled with mercy according to the flesh, that he may know according to the flesh how to succor his people according to their infirmities. One of the things that our redeeming Savior bought in Gethsemane is the ability to understand. I wonder how many times you have cried out in pain that someone just didn't understand. It was hard to find call, c c consolation. It was hard to find comfort when they didn't understand the pain you were going through. I remember trying to comfort my wife while she was giving birth and the look she gave me just said, you don't understand and I didn't. I wanted so very much to understand and to comfort her, but I didn't understand. I remember vividly when she was giving birth to our very first child of 10, and she gave me that look, and then her mother walked into the room, and no words were spoken, but the look on her face said, there is someone who understands, and she took comfort in that. She took comfort in, some, in knowing that someone knew exactly what she just went through. There was peace there. Jesus is that someone for every single one of us, no matter how unique the pain you're experiencing might be. He, in his infinite payment of pain, came to know infinitely your agony, 
your loneliness, your sense of hurt feelings, your betrayal, your feeling alone and abandoned. He knows every pain. There is no pain for which you could not look at him and say he didn't, he didn't understand. He does understand. And because he understands, he knows exactly how to comfort and help you. He knows what to say and when to say it. He knows who to send. He knows exactly what to do. And so often, we don't. My sweet mother suffered the loss of a child. My brother was 10 years old when he passed away. Many people wanting to comfort my mother, wanting to say something that was comforting, actually said things that were very painful because they didn't know what she was feeling. They didn't understand what she was going through. Jesus did. He knew exactly what she was going through. My mother told me that several people had said things that were actually really hurtful. But you can trust that Jesus is not one of those. He knows exactly what you're going through. He knows what you need to hear. He knows what to say and when not to say something. Do you remember when Martha and Mary came out at the death of their brother Lazarus and just wept? He didn't say anything at all. He just wept with them. He knows when to weep. He knows when to comfort. He knows how to comfort. He is our most trusted Savior. And if you will begin to understand that he bought that right and seek his comfort, seek his understanding, cry out to him in pain, he understands. He also knows exactly how to ease the pain and when to. There might be times where he knows I need to row a little bit further. I need to do a little bit more. There may be times when he knows I've done all that I can do and he brings the relief. We can trust him because he understands the human experience. Let me add one more idea that we can combine with that because he knows infinitely the human experience. Let me briefly take you outside the Book of Mormon to the Pearl of Great Price. In the book of Moses, Moses is seeing the cosmos and the worlds that Heavenly Father has created. And they are numberless to Moses. He can't even comprehend their, their depth and their size and their breadth. It says in Moses chapter 1 that Moses beheld the earth, even all of it, and there was not a particle on which he did not behold. He beheld also the inhabitants thereof. And there was not a soul which he beheld not. And he discerned them by the Spirit of God. And their numbers were great, even numberless, as the sand upon the seashore. He beheld many lands, and each land was called earth. And there were inhabitants upon the face. And he asked the question, tell me, I pray thee, why these things are so. Now remember, the number of individuals on earth were numberless to Moses. The number of planets he beheld were numberless to Moses. But when God speaks, he says something wonderful. He says, for my own purpose have I made these things. By my word and by my power have I created them. Worlds without number have I created, and I also created them for mine own purpose. And then he says that only an account of this earth he was going to give Moses. But notice he says, there are many that now stand, meaning worlds, other worlds. But all things are numbered unto me, for they are mine, and I know them. Let's apply that to Christ. That not only is he intimately familiar with the infinite sufferings of the human experience, but that he can say that he numbers and knows every single human being on every single one of those planets. Allow me to walk you through a beautiful little progression in the Book of Mormon that shows who he is in terms of knowing us. We start in the title page of the Book of Mormon. 
This page that you'll find in the beginning of every copy of the book, the Book of Mormon, an account written by the Hand of Mormon. In the second paragraph, in the second paragraph, Moroni is explaining where the book came from and what its purposes are. He suggests three purposes of the Book of Mormon. First, to show unto the remnant of the house of Israel what great things the Lord hath done for their fathers. In other words, the Book of Mormon is filled with the miracles of the past. And I think the, the message is, if he did miracles in the past, he will do miracles today. Secondly, the Book of Mormon will make known the covenants of the Lord, what we must do to not be cast off forever. And finally, the Book of Mormon was written to convince Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God. Now, most of us put a period right there. We, we quote that the Book of Mormon was written to convince people that Jesus is the Christ, period. But there's not a period there. There's a comma. The Book of Mormon was written to show what he does, what he does as the Christ. And so the, we get the first one, that he manifests himself unto all nations. The Book of Mormon stands as a witness that Christ will manifest himself to all nations. Can you think of the nations mentioned in the Book of Mormon? And does Christ manifest himself to every single one of them? The Book of Mormon mentions the Jews. Did Christ manifest himself to the Jews? Yes, the Book of Mormon is the story of the Nephite and Lamanite nations. Does Christ manifest himself to the Nephites and the Lamanites? The Book of Mormon mentions the Mulekites and the Jaredites. Does Christ manifest himself to the Mulekites and the Jaredites? Is there any nation mentioned in the Book of Mormon to whom Christ does not manifest himself? Therefore, can we assume that he numbers and knows and manifests himself to every nation? Now, I'm not a nation, and it's possible that I could get lost in his manifestation to my nation. So let's peel off a layer and go to a smaller group. What would be smaller than a nation? In the language of the Book of Mormon, it would be a kindred, tongue, or a people. Let's turn now to Alma chapter 26, where Ammon is praising the Lord for doing something very wonderful to a smaller group of Lamanites than the entire nation. Not the entire nation was saved. But Ammon praises God and says in the very last verse of this chapter, now my brethren, we see that God is mindful of every people. Whatsoever land they may be in, he numbereth his people and his bowels of mercy are over all the earth. He is mindful of every people. He manifests himself to every nation and he is mindful of every people. Now think about the people in the Book of Mormon. Think about the smaller groups than a nation, the people. How about when Alma the elder is converted and takes a group of people out to the waters of Mormon? Was Christ mindful of that group? He was. Was he mindful of the anti-Nephi-Lehi's? He was. Every group of people in the Book of Mormon, we have a testimony that Jesus was mindful of them. Therefore, we can rest assured that he is mindful of my people. He is mindful of my family, of my small little circle of acquaintance. He numbers and knows. He manifests himself. He is mindful of my people. Now, it could be argued that I might be lost in him being mindful of my people. What about me as an individual? Now we turn to Mosiah chapter 27 to the experience of a very wayward individual who fought against the church. His name was Alma the Younger. Was God mindful of Alma? Alma testifies, I rejected my Redeemer and denied that which had been spoken by our fathers. But now that they may foresee that he will come and that... He remembereth every creature of his creating. 
and he will make himself manifest unto all. We can apply every one of those words to each one of us individually. He numbers and knows me. He will manifest himself to me. He is mindful of my group of people and he remembers me. The Book of Mormon stands as a testimony that Jesus remembers each and every one of us. Did he remember Lehi and his family when Jerusalem was about to be destroyed? Did he remember Nephi when his brethren were beating him up? Did he remember Enos? Did he remember Jacob? Did he remember Alma the elder who was a wicked priest of Noah? Did he remember Alma the younger? Did he remember Ammon who was also rebellious? Did he remember Lamoni? Did he remember Lamoni's people? Did he remember Lamoni's father? Did he remember an inactive wayward person who'd walked away from the church named Amulek in a very wicked city named Ammoniah? Does he remember all of us? Did he remember the Nephites and visit them? The Book of Mormon stands as a witness that he numbers, knows, remembers, is mindful of, and will manifest himself to each one of us individually if we call out to him and cry out for his help. Now let me do one more. Let me go smaller than an individual. The Book of Mormon stands as a testimony that he remembers the smallest among us, the children, often lost, often forgotten. In 3 Nephi 17, when he appears in the American continent and gathers the children and asks them to come to him, Watch what he does. He takes them one by one, each child, and blesses and prays for them. Now, as I've pondered that, I testify that I just don't think he had the same blessing for each one of them. I think each one got a blessing that was unique to them. I think the Book of Mormon is trying to testify that Jesus has a blessing for you. He is asking the Father for a specific blessing for you. Now, that's, I think, what we're going to go to. His intimate knowledge of the human experience and his intimate knowledge of you. He remembers you. He knows you. He knows everything that you need. And he has a blessing for you. And he is praying unto the Father for you. Now, this is sometimes difficult. The Book of Mormon is testifying that he not only knows how to comfort me in my pain, but he knows which pains I need. He knows what I need to experience to be saved. He knows how to save me as an individual. And he knows that's different than how to save you. The human experiences that you need in order to be saved are not the same ones that I need. He knows the difference between you and me. And he knows the human experiences well enough to know which ones you need and which ones I need. And he tailors our human experience for what each one of us needs. Allow me to walk you through one of the beautiful contributions that was taken out of the Bible. Here is clearly a plain and precious chapter that was removed from the Bible. It was from the prophet Zenos. We have no book of Zenos in the current Old Testament, but clearly he was a mighty prophet and is quoted frequently in the Book of Mormon. In Jacob chapter 5, Jacob restores an entire allegory from Zenos. It is the allegory of the tame and the wild olive tree. Now, the beauty of this verse is it applies to all of us collectively, to the whole house of Israel. You can find the story of Lehi going to America. You can find the apostasy and the coming of Christ. You can find the restoration. It is the story of all of us collectively. But the beauty of this allegory is that it applies to each of us. I am the tree he's trying to preserve. He knows me. 
He knows where I'm most likely to decay, how I'm most likely to go astray. He knows all my weaknesses. And he knows the human experiences that are best for me to experience. So notice when the tree begins to decay, he asks an intriguing question. He says in verse 47, what could I have done more to my vineyard? Have I slackened mine hand that I have not nourished it? No, I have nourished it. I have digged about it. I have pruned it. I have dunged it. I have stretched forth my hand and I don't want to lose it. It grieveth me that I should hew down the trees of my vineyard. He asks again in verse 49, what could I have done more for my vineyard? Now, do you see the implication? He's, re he's really answering the question, not asking it. I believe he's trying to say, I have done everything that I knew needed to be done to this tree. What more could I have done? And the answer is nothing. Your life is his knowledge of what you need to be saved. He knew that everything going on in your life is your best chance at salvation. Because if someone else's life would have been better for you, I believe the implication of that question in Jacob chapter 5 is saying he would have given you that life. If someone else's life would have been better for you, then that life would have been yours. Because he wants to save you and he knows how to. But I believe he's trying to say that exactly what's happening in your, your life, your coming to this earth when you did, into the family, with the challenges, with the physical circumstances, your body, your talent level, your life is what he knows is your best chance at salvation. He knows the human experience and he knows you. And he knows exactly what you need to be saved. And if something else would have been better for you, he would have done it. Now, this is difficult because he wants to save us. And sometimes trees don't naturally grow the way they should. And we, as children, sometimes are prideful and we have natural tendencies that lead us away. The Book of Mormon is going to tell us that the enemy inside of us, that the natural man inside of me is an enemy to God. So my tree needs to be pruned. Now watch him do it. In the very beginning of the allegory, when it starts to decay, end of verse three, it says it began to detreat, decay. Notice verse four is round one. It's very tender, very delicate. He prunes, he digs, he nourishes. But it's not enough. It's not enough to save the tree. Sometimes the cuts have to go deeper. I know it has to have, I know it has in my life. And I know plenty of other people where the cuts have had to go deeper. And so verse six, the top is going to perish. And he says in verse seven, something he's going to repeat many times in this allegory. It grieveth me that I should lose this tree. I'm not going to lose it. And he knows exactly what to do. So notice what he does in verse seven. Right in the middle of verse seven, he plucks. He plucks the tree. Now, the act of plucking is taking something in my life and ripping it out. And I know each one of you watching this video have been plucked. I know he has plucked something out of your life, whether that's a person or an opportunity or something that you loved has been plucked. And it's hurtful and it's painful. And sometimes we question him. But the testimony here is he knows what he's doing. When he plucks, he knows exactly what to pluck. He's infinitely familiar with the human experience and he's infinitely familiar with you and he knows exactly what needs to be plucked for that tree to be saved. In verse nine, number two, he grafts. Now the act of grafting is bringing something I never expected to be part of my life and sticking it into my life. He grafts. He puts things into my life I never thought I'd have to deal with. Things like sicknesses and cancers and pandemics and the loss of a job or so many other things. He grafts them into my life. 
Things I love that I want to hold on to, he plucks. And sometimes things that I never thought I'd have to deal with, he grafts in. And now I have to deal with that graft. There's one more. Verse 13, sometimes he places. He took the tree and he placed it in the nithermost part. Have you ever been growing beautifully and the Lord just yanks you out of that and placed you somewhere else? Some of you thought you'd go to this place on your mission and he yanked you and sent you to that place. You got placed in the nethermost part of the vineyard. Sometimes he places us. He puts us where we never thought we'd have to grow. He puts us in a challenging circumstances. We've been placed. So he plucks, he grafts, and he places this tree. Now, years go by. Look at verse 15, a long time passed, and he decides to come back. First, he starts with the tree that got plucked and grafted. Now, notice verse 17, the tree began to bear fruit. It worked. He knew it, and it worked. In the middle of verse 18 is a testimony that I believe the Book of Mormon is screaming out for our individual lives. Now, if we had not grafted in those branches, and I think he's also talking about the plucking, the tree thereof would have perished. If you hadn't experienced that painful event in your life, the tree would have perished. He knew it. He knew you well enough to know what human experiences you needed. And had he not done that, the tree would have perished. That's who he is. That's what he bought in Gethsemane. We have a living redeemer who is intimately involved in the very details of our life who is handpicking the experiences I need to have as a mortal because he knows me and he knows each one of them intimately and he knows how to save me and he's going to do what I need him to do. Let's go to the tree that went to the, the further, the, you know, the nithermost part. Let's, let's go to the tree that got placed. Verse 19, let us go to the nithermost part of the vineyard and behold if the natural branches of the tree have not brought forth much fruit. And in verse 20, yes, sure enough, by placing them where he did, it brought forth much fruit. Now, this is where the servant kind of comes to symbolize all of us. And some of us, often say the same thing. Why? Verse 21, how comest thou hither to plant this tree? Why'd you do it, Lord? Why did you pluck? Why did you graft? Why did you place? Why did you take my mother away from me or my son or my wife? Why did you take that opportunity away? Why did you graft in this unique challenge? Why did you graft in the cancer? Why did you pluck and graft and place? That's the question in verse 21. And then come five magical words. I'm going to stop it at five words. You could keep reading, but I believe these are the magical words that show us, that unlock who the Savior is. When the, we, he is questioned, why did you pluck? Why did you graft? Why did you place? I testify he will say these five words in verse 22. Counsel me not, I knew. That is our Redeemer. He is not a distant God. He is involved in your life. Even if you push him away, he is involved in your life. He knows how to comfort you, how to bring peace to your soul. But because he knows each of those human experiences and he knows you, he knows which of those human experiences that you need. And he can do it all at the same time. He is astounding in his brilliance. He can allow me to have the human experiences I need at the same time you are having the ones you need. 
And when we are tempted to say, why, Lord? We need to hear him say those five words. Counsel me not, I knew. He bought that knowledge in Gethsemane. He earned that by what he suffered. I love this little story from Elder Marvin J. Ashton of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. I'll paraphrase. He talked about a father traveling in a train with a blind daughter. He had only purchased one ticket and was holding the daughter on his lap. It was a long train ride, and that must have been, gotten uncomfortable. A friend sitting next to the father noticed that he'd been holding his daughter this whole time, and he asked if he could hold the daughter for a while, give him some relief. And the father consented and passed his daughter over to the friend, and the friend held the daughter for a while. After a moment, realizing what he'd done, he turned to the blind daughter and said, do you know who's holding you? And the daughter said, no, but you do. And then Elder Ashton said the following, when sorrow, tragedy, and heartbreaks occur in our lives, wouldn't it be comforting if when the whisperings of God say, do you know why this has happened to you? we could have the peace of mind to answer, no, but you do. I bear my solemn testimony and thank and praise the Book of Mormon for helping me know this, for providing the restored plain and precious truths that have taught me this doctrine, that our Savior knows every human pain intimately, every human experience, every affliction, to an infinite level and to an infinite depth. He knows depression and addiction. He knows every human condition. And he knows me. He knows my thoughts, my desires. He remembers me from premortal life. He knows my tendencies to do certain things. And putting those two together, he knows what mortal experiences I need to have in order to be saved. I testify that Jesus knows how to save me. And so sometimes he plucks and grafts and places because he knows. Of him, I bear testimony and praise him. I don't know why they happen to me, but he does. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Let me give you a thought question for this video. When have you been plucked, grafted, placed? When have you been plucked, grafted, and placed in such a way that you lived long enough to now look back and see the wisdom? You can now see that he knew what he was doing. Would you be willing to share an experience of a plucking or a grafting or a placing where you have now gained the insight to be able to see exactly what he saw or maybe in general patterns what he saw and you can now see the wisdom in having been plucked or grafted or placed? There are so many examples. I'm thinking of an example of Elder Uchtdorf where he told the story about wanting a red bike in his youth but had the Lord granted that red bike in his younger years, Elder Uchtdorf may very well have missed out on the airplane he loved so much in his later years. That was a plucking that Elder Uchtdorf knew was for his benefit. I'll include that in the reference for this week's class if you wanna go read that as an example. But what is yours? When is a time you were plucked, grafted, or placed in a way that you now see was wisdom in God, that he knew what he was doing, and he knew what was best for you? I'd love you to share it, either with me individually by texting me or with the class if you want to share it with us as a group. And once again, if this video has been beneficial to you, would you share it with someone who may need it? I know there's a lot of people who need to know that they have a Savior out there who understands, and that there's reason and purpose for the challenges that we face. Is there someone you could share this video with that would benefit from it? Please do so. Thank you for joining us. We will continue next week.